My name is Noli Brazil. I'm an associate professor um, at the University of California, Davis. And um, before we sort of get started, I want to acknowledge my co-organizer, Jennifer Candepan, who's um, an assistant professor at Brown University. Uh, she'll be joining us a little bit later. And I also want to thank all the organizers um, and the various folks who put this symposium uh, together. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, sessions that I've attended, and uh, I'm hoping and I'm sure that this session will provide a lot of great um, applications and uh, of spatial data science. Uh, so um, the description of our, uh, our session, our full description of our session is located in uh, the session's uh, website, and I'll provide a link in the chat um, that provides uh, this, the session description as well as all our speakers and their abstracts for their uh, presentations today um, and we'll go in the order of the presenters that are listed on uh, that website um, and so we have a great panel uh, 12 minutes each for each presentation and thanks Noli uh, and thanks to both Noli and Jen for organizing this I'm excited to be part of the symposium uh, so today I'll be addressing two main questions first to what extent do residents of affluent or high poverty neighborhoods, so across really the socioeconomic spectrum, um, tend to visit or receive visits from socioeconomically similar neighborhoods? That is, do affluent neighborhoods visit and receive visits from other affluent neighborhoods? Um, and so too for high poverty neighborhoods. And all of this analysis will be in the United States context due to the data I have. Second question is, does this relationship vary across commuting zones? Um, you can think of commuting zones as roughly metro areas um, or uh, areas around a cluster of uh, small, smaller rural places um, that tend to travel uh, within each other. Uh, and if this relationship varies across commuting zones, uh, what might explain this variation? So to contextualize the project a bit, uh, there's a long, uh, rich social science literature identifying neighborhood effects on a whole host of uh, different individual outcomes. Um, so at the top, you have the Opportunity Atlas from Raj Chetty's team that identifies important neighborhood effects on income, health, well-being. Uh, at the bottom, uh, a map from over a century ago uh, by W.E.B. Du Bois uh, from his research in Philadelphia on neighborhood inequality. So this is really a classic social science question. Now, scholarship also recognizes that neighborhoods are physically segregated, such that affluent or high poverty neighborhoods are often adjacent to other economically similar neighborhoods. And that's illustrated by this map here on the right of Boston, uh, Massachusetts, where dark green uh, indicates most affluent and light, light green is least affluent. So you can think green, uh, money, uh, more affluent. Uh, but we can go further, uh, thanks to some recent data innovations, uh, than this spatial proximity model. Uh, we know that individuals don't exist solely in their neighborhoods or even in the immediately proximal spaces. They travel about their cities and communities in the course of their daily lives. Um, and so in this way, neighborhoods are not really islands as traditional models of neighborhood effects might assume. Uh, they're instead structurally connected uh, based on the everyday mobility flows uh, between them. Now, at the individual level, uh, we know that people's activity spaces um, can predict their health and well being. Um, activity spaces predict outcomes like stress, loneliness, uh, feelings of cohesion or belonging, access to various resources. At the neighborhood level, uh, these structural connections between neighborhoods are important for a range of measures of vitality. Uh, and residents' well being. Uh, things like violence, COVID 19 transmission, exposure to toxins, and beyond. Uh, and so the work I'm presenting today and the broader project uh, seeks to measure these neighborhood networks and assess their implications for inequality. 
So again, just my two research questions. And I'm going to do this work by merging uh, data from the 2015 to 19 American Community Survey. Um, it's like the long form of the US Census, except it's given every year um, when the long form was phased out. Uh, and I'm going to merge those data with uh, calendar year 2019 data from SafeGraph uh, and their social distancing metrics data set. So this is pre-pandemic data, this sort of more um, structurally um, enduring uh, neighborhood mobility patterns. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is just construct a rough measure of residential neighborhood socioeconomic status, so disadvantage or advantage. Uh, I measure it using seven neighborhood characteristics. So these are just demographics of who lives in neighborhoods, things like poverty, unemployment, public assistance receipt, educational attainment, um, and high status uh, workers, shares of high status workers in neighborhoods. And again, dark green, more affluent, light green, uh, more poverty or lack of affluence. Uh, and then I'm gonna move beyond just the residential neighborhood effects uh, perspective uh, to study interneighborhood mobility and connections uh, based on neighborhood socioeconomic status. And to look at interneighborhood mobility, I'm using data from SafeGraph. Um, SafeGraph has really countless geolocation pings over the course of a year from 45 million US mobile phones. Um, so this is probably about one eighth, roughly, uh, of the mobile phones in the United States. And these data are for the full calendar year to try and exclude tourist visits and look at um, visits between neighborhoods that are more likely to reflect uh, co-residents of, of the same community. Uh, I, I'm only looking at within commuting zone visits or um, visits between counties that are in adjacent uh, commuting zones and, and the counties are adjacent themselves. Um, and so I'm conceiving of neighborhoods um, a, a, as a mobility network where neighborhoods uh, are nodes and then the connections between neighborhoods are edges. Uh, and the weight of the edge between any two neighborhoods um, is really the proportion uh, of visits from ascending neighborhood, uh, the proportion of its visits over the course of an entire year uh, that go to each destination neighborhood. Um, so uh, I'm excluding loops for those who are uh, aware of network parlance or visits uh, made in the same neighborhood. Um, and so really this tells us the proportion uh, of any neighborhood's visits that are to every other neighborhood in its commuting zone. Uh, and for example, this is just the visit density in the city of Boston. Um, so a good check on face validity um, the, this pattern makes a lot of sense. Downtown Boston tends to get the most visits along with the Logan Airport. If you want to take a look at one neighborhood, Upham's Corner is an illustrative neighborhood in Boston. Um, its residents tend to visit and be visited by every other neighborhood um, in the course of 2019. Um, so there's really no neighborhood in Boston that is not connected to. The white spaces are park areas with no residents, so those drop out of the data. If you look at the greater Boston metro area, um, this is a really large area actually, 90% um, of neighborhoods, uh, which I define as census block groups, um, are visited or receive uh, or send visits to Upham's Corner. So there's a, a large degree of connection across neighborhoods here. Um, so how am I gonna calculate uh, the extent to which a neighborhood visits and receives visits from uh, socioeconomically affluent or high poverty neighborhoods? Uh, well, I'm going to calculate two measures of mobility-based neighborhood disadvantage um, or advantage. Uh, Out-degree neighborhood disadvantage uh, is basically just a visit-weighted average of the residential disadvantage scores um, of the neighborhoods that any neighborhood's residents visit. So if you have a focal neighborhood you're looking at, um, what is the average uh, disadvantage score of all the neighborhoods its residents tend to visit, um, weighted by the degree of visits. So this really looks at where do residents of a neighborhood go? By contrast, who comes to the neighborhood? 
Um, and this is in degree neighborhood disadvantage. This is the um, average neighborhood disadvantage score of all the other neighborhoods that tend to visit a neighborhood, weighted by the extent to which those neighborhoods visit it, as well as the sending population uh, of the origin neighborhood to account for population differences. And so I have this measure of L degree and a measure of N degree disadvantage. And then I'm just going to average them to calculate a measure of mobility-based neighborhood disadvantage. L degree and N degree disadvantage are highly correlated. Um, so you, you don't really have to worry about the measures not, not moving in the same direction and me averaging here. Um, and then I standardize this measure. Um, residential disadvantage is also standardized. So both of them have mean zero and standard deviation of one. So if we just look at the bivariate association here, this is a heat map um, with residential neighborhood disadvantage scores on the x-axis, mobility disadvantage scores on the y-axis at the neighborhood level. Um, there's a fairly strong correlation between a neighborhood's uh, resident socioeconomic demographics and the other neighborhoods it's attached to based on visit patterns, but the measures aren't duplicative. Um, so, you know, about little less than two thirds of the variation in mobility disadvantage can be explained by residential disadvantage. It's a good chunk, but it's not determinative. Um, if we look at the functional form of this relationship, this is just a linear fit versus a quadratic fit. You can see a linear fit does a pretty good job here. So in trying to predict a neighborhood's mobility disadvantage score, I'm just gonna use a linear function of its residential disadvantage score. And basically I'm estimating uh, multi-level models here with um, random coefficients for a neighborhood's residential disadvantage scores. Um, and then I'm going to look at that variation in the residential disadvantage mobility disadvantage relationship and try and explain it uh, based on some commuting zone features, things like income inequality, income segregation, um, racial residential segregation, as well as neighborhood level features. So um, the density of various types of establishments, um, as well as the incidence of gun violence in a neighborhood. And I uh, interact um, categorical specifications of each of these uh, predictors with the residential disadvantage score to allow residential disadvantage to vary. Uh, so this first model doesn't have any of these explanatory variables. Um, so our main coefficient on residential disadvantage um, is up there. I don't really want you to pay attention to it, but it's about 0.36. What I'm more interested in is commuting zone level variation in this coefficient. Um, and the variance is about 0.04, standard deviation of about 0.2. So there's a lot of variation here um, to explain um, in the relationship between residential disadvantage and mobility disadvantage. Um, commuting zone indicator variables don't explain much but interacting commuting zone characteristics really does explain a lot um, of the variation here. You can explain about 60% of the variation. Neighborhood level indicators don't explain much, and it's really these commuting zone factors that are um, driving this variation in the relationship between residential disadvantage and mobility disadvantage. One key um, predictor that I'll highlight here is income residential segregation of a commuting zone. Commuting zones with high levels of income segregation um, have a really large gap in mobility disadvantage scores between um, residentially affluent and residentially impoverished neighborhoods, a gap of about two standard deviations between the fifth and 95th percentile. Commuting zones with low levels of income segregation, that gap is almost a full standard deviation lower of just a one standard deviation gap in mobility disadvantage scores um, between low um, and high disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, so the difference in gaps, about 0.93. If we look at the difference in gaps um, between low and high levels of things like median income, um, commuting zone racial segregation, neighborhood characteristics, you can see the three primary drivers a variation in this residential to mobility disadvantage or income inequality, income segregation, um, and the diversity of a neighborhood. Um, so to wrap up, uh, what does my analysis show? Well, residentially impoverished or residentially affluent communities tend to visit and be visited by socioeconomically similar communities, but there's important heterogeneity. 
Um, and those three commuting zone level factors I identified are, are key here. In particular, income segregation promotes the isolation of affluence. Um, and, and this suggests that higher order structure of cities really impacts mobility segregation. Um, and this is important, again, because we know that mobility-based exposures for any given neighborhood um, are, are critical for its level of vitality and its residents' life chances. Um, so that was um, a whirlwind, but I only had 12 minutes. I look forward to your questions. And thanks again, Noli and Jen. Great. Thank you, Brian, uh, for that, uh, for the presentation. Um, up next will be uh, Jill Han, who is an assistant professor at Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago. Joel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Noli. OK, um, well, once again, thank you to Noli and to Jen for organizing this, this really interesting session. Uh, I am here to present some uh, work that is, that is joint with Noli. Um, and we're going to be looking at gas prices and um, visit patterns. Uh, I'm an economist. I'm interested in inequality, and I think this uh, the use of geospatial data is really interesting in um, allowing us to tackle some questions of inequality. Um, okay, so here's the question. Um, do changes in local gas price for a city affect travel patterns in different neighborhoods differently? Looking at low-income versus high-income neighborhoods, do we see differences in, in that effect? Um, so I, I think gas prices are interesting because they're uh, really highly salient to consumers. They're a really good indicator of how consumers feel about the economy, about uh, their, their, their well-being in the U.S. in general. Um, and we uh, think that there is a disproportionate financial hardship of high gas prices on low-income consumers. But we don't know a whole lot about how low-income consumers respond differently in terms of uh, where they choose to travel and how often they choose to travel. And uh, that's where uh, spatial data, using uh, spatial data, or more specifically, cell phone traffic data comes into play. So a summary of what, we've, uh, what we're doing in this project, what we've done so far, is uh, we study uh, within a city the gap between uh, the highest quartile of neighborhood income and the lowest quartile of neighborhood income uh, in terms of uh, the frequency of outgoing travel or the mean distance travel uh, out of these neighborhoods. So um, just for a shorthand, I'm going to be calling this the Q4, Q1 gap. We merge uh, cell phone spatial data uh, to uh, gas price data for 10 large U.S. cities. Uh, and we look at the impact of the observed changes to city level gas price on these travel patterns. Uh, because our time period from 2018 to 2021 spans the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the onset of the COVID pandemic, we've split our analysis into before and after March of 2020. Um, also, because we have uh, three cities in our sample experienced an increase to the state gas tax rate, we're also going to look at the impact of that policy on, on, on these travel patterns and, and these disparities. OK, uh, so like I said, this is, this, uh, the use of this data gives us an uh, opportunity to look at something that uh, is, is a little bit elusive. So uh, other research has managed to look at how driving speed responds to gas price or how behavior like carpooling responds to gas price, but not really where people go. And uh, there's a, you know, there's a, I think, active and, and growing literature using uh, spatial data to, uh, to tackle questions such as the uh, activity-based segregation uh, where, where uh, residents spend their time, as well as just looking at the impact of COVID in general. OK. Um, the, the data we're using, it's uh, similar to Brian's data, but slightly different data product. We're using SafeGraph neighborhood patterns. These are anonymized cell phone geolocation records. Uh, and what we are uh, defining as a visit is actually a, a cell phone that's, that, that uh, lives in a certain neighborhood based on its nighttime location and stops for a time period of greater than one minute in a destination neighborhood. 
all of these neighborhoods are measured at the census block group level. Um, and I don't really have the time to go into this here, but there are some privacy protection measures that are imposed on this. Uh, that mean our, our there there's some measurement error in our um, in our variables. Taking this uh, cell phone data, we merge it with uh, gas price data taken from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. This is public. Uh, we. Our sample covers 10 large U.S. cities, but these cities are large enough that they uh, contain over 5% of the U.S. population. Uh, and then we take neighborhood income uh, and other neighborhood variables from the 2010 decennial census. Just to give you a sense of what the 10 cities are, uh, this graph is plotting the price per gallon of uh, of uh, the, the 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 gas price per gallon for for the ten cities in our sample, um, our uh, I think you can see the mouse. Uh, our sample period starts at the beginning of twenty eighteen and goes until uh, the middle of twenty twenty one. So we are unable to capture that big price spike in gas that happened in twenty twenty two. That's something that will have to be uh, left for for the future. However, we still do see lots of uh, variation in gas prices, both within and across cities with, within our time period. Okay, so first we're going to we're going to describe the impact of gas patterns on these income disparities. Um, we create our dependent variables um, by aggregating for each home neighborhood uh, the total number of outgoing visits from from that neighborhood. This is our measure of the frequency of travel. Just looking at the total number. Uh, now, using the spatial uh, the, the spatial nature of this data, we can actually uh, derive a, a measure of mean distance traveled. We look at the home and destination neighborhood block groups. We look at their uh, the, their centroids, and we take we take the distance um, we take these distances, and we weight it by the frequency of visits uh, between these neighborhoods. Okay. Now, um, I will not spend a lot of time on this on, on these equations. But this is our this is our regression specification to talk about the uh, impact of gas prices on income disparities in visit patterns. We're just focusing on one of the dependent variables. It's the log of the number of visits. So what we'll be looking at is actually this coefficient beta here. Specifically uh, for this presentation, let's just talk about B one. Beta one actually tells us the difference in the impact of an increase in gas price for a bottom neighborhood in comparison to the top neighborhood income uh, quartile. So we're looking at the, the poorest quartile neighborhood versus the richest quartile neighborhood, and we're looking at how gas prices affect these two neighborhoods differently. That difference is captured in beta one. We chose this specification because it uh, allows us to control for fixed differences across neighborhood any differences in the populations of these neighborhoods is actually absorbed into uh, what our controls, and as well as any uh, variation in, at the city level in terms of incentives or travel, such as weather that's common at the city level. And also when we're thinking about cell phone data, this also absorbs any variation in the sampling rates of cell phones uh, at the city level. So we're going to do this separately for the pre-pandemic and pandemic period, as I have uh, alluded to. And we are going to show you the results now. OK, so let me talk you through this, uh, these two sets of graphs. We're looking at the gap in visit frequencies. So based on our coefficients, we can derive a measure of what's the difference between the, the richest neighborhood and the poorest neighborhood in terms of how often um, you, you, you leave the house or you visit outside of your block group. During the pre-pandemic period in red, uh, unsurprisingly, we see that rich Neighborhoods tend to have more outgoing visits than uh, poor neighborhoods. So this is a positive number. When we increase the gas price, this gap goes down. So rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, that gap is relatively compressed. Uh, this is actually something that we would um, that we would predict is pretty standard if uh, low-income households uh, are less flexible in their needs for travel and they take less recreational travel. One thing that, that's really interesting that we, we note 
is that during the pandemic, this pattern of gas price actually reverses very dramatically. So during the pandemic, if gas price increases, the gap between uh, rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods actually goes up. And I think uh, we are, we're uh, interested in kind of unpacking why, but, but this is kind of, uh, th this is a, a, a very striking finding at, at this point. Now, in comparison, if we look at the gap in distance, so how far do these households travel on average, we don't see a lot of uh, impact either before or after the pandemic in terms of gas price. So it looks like how far people travel is not really affected by gas price, but how often they travel is affected by gas price. And something in the pandemic has, has shifted the, the way these income disparities play out. Okay, I, th I think uh, in the last two or three minutes, let me now talk about the impact of, of tax changes. During our sample period, three of the, the cities experienced uh, a, an increase in the gas tax. Technically, this is a, an increase in the gas tax at the state level, but um, we, we are just focusing on the cities we have in our sample that lie in the, uh, the, the respective states. I'll also note that all of these uh, Tax increases happened during the pre-pandemic period. Um, no state, uh, no state, to my knowledge, increased taxes during the pandemic. So I think it's interesting to st study the gas tax separately because um, the observed changes in gas price could be due to a, a number of factors on the supply side, on the demand side, and uh, a state gas tax is something that is a policy lever that um, is controlled directly by, by the state government or, or the respective governments. And it is something that um, policymakers may want to understand the, the implications of. We study this using a synthetic control approach. So skipping what the, uh, the, the notation, uh, we are comparing a, a city, a treated city, right? either Chicago, Cleveland, or Miami. Um, what was the impact of this, uh, the, the increase in the gas tax relative to a weighted set of control cities? These control cities experienced no change in the gas tax rate, and we have weighted them in order to match the previous historical trends in the gas price. For this part, we find that um, we find the, that the results are are very mixed. We find actually that for one city, we have a very small, insignificant impact. For for Cleveland, this shrinks the gap, and for Miami, it increases the gap. So we think that there's, there could be lots of city level factors that are uh, influencing even how a gas tax change affects these income disparities and we have more work to do here. Um, I think I am about at my time, so we'll just talk about where we want to take this next. Um, we've got a, a slightly different new strategy for looking at the impact of gas tax changes, really to try to confirm what we found. Um, with a different kind of weighting, we would like we are we think it's possible to to uh, use a larger set of control cities, not just the ten we have in our sample, but really all the cities that are available in the uh, uh, in, in the cell phone data. Uh, okay, and I and I believe that's my time. So um, thank you once again to the organizers, and uh, thank you thanks to you all. Thank you, Joel, for that great presentation. Um, and once again, a reminder, if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A uh, section um, on the right-hand side of your browser. So our last presentation is Jonathan Tolson, who is a PhD candidate in sociology at Brown University. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Uh, fantastic. I'll open my document here. Um, hope that's coming through. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Millie and Jennifer, for organizing. It's great to uh, see all these uh, super interesting uh, presentations today. Um, so uh, I'll be um, spending the next 12 minutes talking about uh, an approach to understand uh, neighborhood spatial stratification processes um, and the formation of neighborhood racial inequality uh, through an environmental lens. Uh, focusing on the late 19th and early 20th uh, centuries. So this was a period when the um, spatial organization of inequality in cities uh, was beginning to scale up to the neighborhood level. And um, so that's driven by uh, this kind of uh, 
goal here is driven by a mismatch between uh, research on the formation of uh, neighborhood scale racial inequality uh, in U.S. cities on the one hand, and on the social stratification of environmental risks and hazards on the other. Um, so it's about mobility in a, in a historical and, and, and kind of long-term uh, senses as cities are uh, restructuring and uh, transforming over time. Um, so to dig into this, uh, we have to go back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and that's where we'll be, where we'll be living um, for most of this talk. And uh, so the kind of the short answer is that, you know, spatial, the spatial structure of racial inequality in cities um, looked really different starting in the late 1800s. Um, so rather than a pattern of contiguous um, unequal neighborhoods, inequality in this period was more of a street level um, phenomenon. And this began to change kind of over the course of the early 20th century as inequality uh, expanded and started to consolidate at the neighborhood scale. Um, so it's kind of scholarly interest in environmental risk and inequality in cities is a lot more recent. Um, so up until the creation of the EPA in the 1970s, there really isn't any centralized uh, regulatory structure to keep track of uh, environmental hazardous sites uh, in cities. And that's really not until the 80s that we start to see um, social movements and scholarly attention uh, turn to the, the, this, these patterns of inequality. So uh, breezing through this, these big diagrams, so you know, no worries, it's hard to see. But uh, so basically, you know, a ton of literature has kind of developed in that uh, environmental inequality direction since then. Um, but because of this, this uh, data availability problem, uh, environmental research is almost entirely focused on the post-EPA period, um, which is when kind of neighborhood scale inequality is an already established fact on the ground. So we have almost no kind of empirical spatial work on uh, environmental inequality before about the 1960s. And so because of this also, you know, the kind of urban literature uh, lacks a kind of large scale empirical engagement um, with environmental risk during that key period when spatial patterns of inequality um, were restructuring and consolidating uh, at the neighborhood scale. So my goal here is to kind of present a way to overcome some of these uh, disjunctures, to begin to overcome some of these uh, disjunctures. Um, and I'll do this using a um, computational approach to uh, recover uh, a certain class of hazardous site data in cities, starting in uh, about 1880 and running through uh, 1930. Um, and I'll use these data to start to analyze the, how the social stratification of environmental risk uh, was transformed during this period of the restructuring of urban inequality. Um, and the data that I'll be focusing on are related to this, uh, the manufactured gas industry, which is uh, the first uh, urban fossil fuel utility. And it, it was an industry that produced um, gas out of coal for uh, heating and lighting and cooking fuel. Um, so cities would be uh, home, would be, would have maybe a, a dozen or more um, large-scale gas works that were scattered around town. Um, there were these kind of enormous monolithic uh, structures and, you know, covering multiple city blocks. Um, Gasworks Park in Seattle is a place you can go see some of the kind of leftover remnants of the industry today. And there were these uh, huge kind of sources of air and water and soil pollution. So basically, it's, it's this kind of hugely polluting industry in its lifetime uh, corresponds well to this period of uh, when urban inequality was uh, consolidating. At the neighborhood scale. Um, so I, I start by uh, building out a, a site data set um, for this uh, coal gas industry across a sample of U.S. cities, um, and then construct a, a set of measures for um, uh, that are appropriate to the changing structure of urban inequality uh, in the early 20th century. Um, so to do this, uh, you know, I put together kind of a computational um, machine learning based uh, image analysis pipeline that locates uh, sites related to the coal gas industry using a uh, corpus of historic uh, building level map images. And I'll gloss over this kind of quickly, but um, the pipeline lets me uh, track the industry at a much greater level of detail than uh, prior attempts to do so. And also to uh, locate sites related to the coal gas industry um, a lot faster and, and at scale. So this kind of starts to deal with some of the data availability problems that I talked about earlier. 
Um, I'm going to measure uh, residential proximity to sites related to the coal gas industry, um, mostly using census enumeration districts, which were uh, like census tracts, but a lot smaller. So there were about, in the Providence Rhode Island area, I think there were 140 or 150 uh, enumeration districts in 1930, um, compared to about 30, I think 30 or 40 census tracts today. So relatively small scale measures that approximate a, uh, a walkable neighborhood. We can go into how those were defined by the uh, Census Bureau at that point. But. Um, and then I'll use uh, individual level uh, census microdata to uh, predict uh, individual level proximity to this uh, form of environmental pollution uh, using the uh, 1880 and 1930 uh, sample weights. Um, I focus on uh, 1880 and 1930 um, for a couple of reasons. They kind of bookend the peak and decline of the industry pretty well. Um, and also, 1880 data are available as a geolocated um, household uh, point locations. So that, means let, that lets me uh, reassign 1880 data to a 1930 equivalent uh, enumeration district boundaries. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, so I'm going to focus on uh, six different cities that give us kind of a range of industrial and demographic histories. Um, all of them were you know, expanding considerably over the course of that 50 year period. Um, the San Francisco and Oakland and Minneapolis cases were uh, remained mostly uh, white cities uh, over the 1880-1930 period. Um, New Orleans and Baltimore, um, in contrast, were home to uh, large and long-standing uh, black populations over that period. And Cleveland, uh, some of a different case, was an important uh, destination, destination city during the uh, Great Migration in the early 20th century. Uh, you know, New Orleans doubled in population over that period. Minneapolis grew about tenfold. So there's a lot of churning change going on uh, within and, and between urban areas uh, during that period. Um, so running the Cider Navigation Pipeline for this sample returned uh, 47 different gas production and distribution sites across the six uh, selected cities. And so that's what the, this is what it looks like in San Francisco across those two years. Um, uh, you know, split between uh, sites that were active in 1880 and 1930 and sites that had been active previously and have kind of fallen into disuse. But I'll be focusing kind of the analysis on these active sources of pollution, but the, uh, looking at some of the relic sources as well can, can give us a, a sense of how these, the, the distribution of sites is changing over time. Um, sorry, we can see a lot of, you know, population, industrial geography, are both shifting together pretty significantly over this 50 year period. Um, so I'll go ahead and present a, some of the results of an analysis of how this social stratification of exposure to these sources of kind of extreme environmental pollution uh, started to shift alongside the reorganization of urban inequality. So here's a coefficient plot for a series of uh, logistic models that predict individual level uh, risk separately across the six cities. And there's a lot of information, but I'll, I want to focus on kind of one part of each of these plots. And that's, um, so the, the black lines present uh, the odds of living in a neighborhood that contains at least one of these uh, active gas works for uh, by POC residents compared to non-immigrant whites. Um, and my main interest in, in this quick talk is the slope of each of these lines um, between the two sample waves across the six cities. Um, and kind of the main finding I want to, I want to draw attention to is uh, that we see a uh, positive, for five of the six cases, we see a positive and significant slope um, for this particular coefficient between uh, the two waves. Um, and what that means is that sort of over this kind of 50 year period, as, as populations and, and industrial geography is uh, transforming across the six cases, um, proximity to this uh, significant source of pollution kind of increasingly becomes a function of race and ethnicity. Um, by POC residents are drawn in closer and closer proximity to active polluting infrastructure over time as these patterns of neighborhood inequality are slowly starting to form. And it's kind of more broadly, I think that this, so it provides some evidence that this early formation of neighborhood inequality um, was at least partly an environmental process, potentially. Um, so right, so we have a, kind of a lot of more, more recent work on on early neighborhood inequality 
focuses on um, the redlining maps published by the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, in the early 1930s. And um, you know, a lot of that research says that when uh, Polk comes in uh, in the 30s and sets down some of these kind of extant patterns, uh, neighborhood patterns uh, that they were observing in 1930, that's a paper. Um, kind of what I'm finding here is that this equation of environmental risk and racial marginalization um, is already present at that point at the neighborhood scale. And that it's sort of grown up over the course of that 50 year period that I'm studying. So, um, yeah, so, right, to recap, kind of because of data limitations, we don't have a good understanding of the role of environmental risk in the early formation of neighborhood inequality. Um, cities were transforming spatially in the early 20th century. We don't know what role in pollution, that pollution and risk played in that process. Um, but when we start to kind of open the box of environmental inequality in these earlier periods, uh, we find that risk kind of comes into clearer focus as a more central organizing feature of uh, kind of racial and ethnic settlement, settlement patterns and long-term kind of mobility in the city um, throughout that period of urban transformation. Um, so I think I'm out of time, but thanks everyone for uh, coming to the symposium. And I really appreciate uh, Neil Dean Brazil uh, for organizing.